Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series, which is, we're nearing the end now, is on the Book of Psalms. 13 lessons on the Book of Psalms in the Bible, and there's a lot of material in there, as you probably know. This is lesson number 12 in that series from March 23 of 2024. And our lesson title is Worship That Never Ends. Hmm. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, as we once again open the scriptures and seek to understand these words pre presented in languages that we don't even understand by people who lived so many years ago and in such a different culture, help us to get at least a glimpse of what you intended for us to learn is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Those of you who are parents will recognize this next sentence. Sometimes children do not like long worships. Will we all enjoy worship that never ends? Jim? As our experience of God's grace and power increases, we are prompted to ask with the psalmist, what shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits towards me? The inevitable reply is to devote one's life to being faithful to God. In Psalms, Israel is not simply a nation, but the great assembly. This reveals Israel's primary calling to praise God and to bear witness about him to other nations because the Lord wants all, wants all the world to join his people in worship. The Lord's people are identified with the righteous who worship the Lord and whose Hope is in him and in his love of the Bible study guide. Yeah, certainly primary in our prayers should be thanks to God for all he has done for us. And that should include not only our personal prayers to God, but also our prayers when in assembly with God's people. Our knowledge of God should permeate every aspect of our lives. We are known to God and we know God if we have that privilege. Jennifer? Psalm 134, verses 1 through 3. Come, praise the Lord, all his servants, all who serve in his <laughs> temple at night. Raise your hands in prayer in the temple and praise the Lord. May the Lord, who made heaven and earth, bless you from Zion. Okay, that's, of course, from our Good News Bible. The priestly blessing in Numbers 6, 24 to 26, is repeated in part throughout the Psalms. And I will tell you that... Uh, I won't take time, I'll just very briefly, by serendipitously, and really it was serendipitously, an archaeologist um, found the oldest written portion of scripture ever to be found at the bottom of a grave site, and he found it because he asked a young kid to go and clean the clean the place up and make it nice because we're done. We're going to take pictures. We're just done. And this kid had a hammer and he was, man, that sounds funny. And he knocked a hole in the floor. And down inside there, there were jugs and so forth, all kinds of stuff. And in a couple of those jugs was this, these verses, number 6, 24 to 26. And these would, these would be preserved from at least the, the, the days of of um, Hezekiah somewhere back there. So way back, the oldest known copies, and they're, they're little silver scrolls. They're actually written on silver. Amazing things. Anyway, the, the famous blessing. As we have seen in the past in places like Acts 17, God is not only our creator, but also he sustains us every minute. Dwayne? In the writings of Ellen G. White, every pulsation of the heart is a rebound from the touch of the finger of God. Now that's obviously a very picturesque way of saying things, but what does it mean? It means that your heart would not beat one more time if it weren't for the actual presence of God. And when we say actual presence, I mean, he is the one who make the, makes the chemistry work. He's the one who makes the electricity work. He is the one who sets things up. 
made things so they would work in this particular way. And Acts 17, 25 and 28 basically say the same thing. Some of the Levites were assigned the job of protecting the temple and providing music for services. We talked about that last week. Some of these Levites, the sons of Korah, also wrote some of the Psalms. The Israelites were forbidden to worship any idols, and thus their God was invisible. And you can imagine how that would be a bit of a problem. You know, the, their enemies would come along, or their neighbors would come along and say, well, here's our God, where's your God? Uh, he's up there somewhere. Huh? You mean you can't see him? I mean, just try to imagine that playing out. The temple, the temple served as a kind of substitute and a place for them to worship God. God intends for his faithful people to be a priesthood to all around them. This idea is expressed way back in Exodus 19 before the Mount Sinai experience, Exodus 19, 5 and 6, and several places in the Psalms it's repeated, and finally in 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5. And why is it repeated in 1 Peter 2, 4 and 5? Maybe we should read that. 1 Peter 2, For come to the Lord, the living stone rejected by people as worthless, but chosen by God as valuable. Come as living stones and let yourselves be used in building the spiritual temple where you will be, you will serve as what? Holy priests to offer spiritual and acceptable sacrifice to God through Jesus Christ. And in the Old Testament context, that meant this was what you were supposed to do to represent God to those around them. In a number of Psalms, we are instructed to sing to the Lord a new song. And just examples would be Psalm 33, Psalm 40, Psalm 96, Psalm 98, and 149, just as examples. You want to read that for us, Duane? These Psalms summon people to sing a new song. What is a new song here? The reason for the new song is the fresh recognition of the Lord's majesty and sovereignty over the whole over the world and gratitude for his care and salvation as the creator and judge of the earth. Deliverance from enemies and from death and God's special favor toward Israel are some of the more personal motives to sing a new song. While other any comment? Well, I was going to say, you know, suppose you had just come back from a, a battle and you know your your, your tribe of, of Israel has conquered its enemies, and you were hand you were fighting hand to hand with it, those enemies, and you destroyed them. Would you be thankful that God had protected you? I think that would be an adequate reason for being thankful. Okay, go ahead. While other songs also praise the Lord for His loving kindness and wonders, the new song is a special song expressing rekindled joy and promising renewed devotion to God. The new experience of divine deliverance inspires the people to acknowledge the Lord as their creator and king. The common themes in the Psalms that tell of a new song are trust in God, praise of his wonderful works, and deliverance from affliction, among other things. Okay, from our Bible study gut. So you can see why they would be praying and singing about those things. Um, it is not only in the Psalms where such ideas are mentioned, but also in Isaiah 42, 10 through 12, Revelation 5, 9, and Revelation 14, 3. These passages make it clear that the new song is praise to God for providing salvation for and to the entire universe. And from our Bible study guide, we read these words, God's people Israel is depicted in affectionate terms as a pe people near to him, that is near to God, implying that of all the creation, Israel has the most special status and thus is most obliged and privileged to praise God. When you say most obliged, what does that mean? A lot of responsibility, right? Yeah. The Bible thus encourages believers of all generations to sing the new song in praise of their Redeemer, which carries their unique testimony about salvation and the blood of the Lamb. A new song can depict a fresh song that no one has ever heard before, 
a song that commemorates a vivid experience of God's grace in one's life. The new song can also express hope, in which case the newness of the song is demonstrated in the anticipation of the unique, unprecedented experience of God's majesty in the future. True worship goes beyond sacrifices and offerings and reflects a living relationship with God that is always fresh and dynamic. In a sense, one could simply say that the new song is a new expression even, e uh, even each day of our love and appreciation for what God has done for us from our Bible study guide. So now, challenge for you. If you were given the opportunity to sing a new song, end quote, to God, what words would you use? We won't wait for you to compose your own psalm here, but who is worthy to offer that kind of praise to God? Go ahead. Jennifer, I think that's yours. Oh, uh, Psalm chapters 15, 1 through 5. Lord, who may enter your temple? Who may worship on Zion, your sacred hill? Those who obey God in everything and always do what is right, whose words are true and sincere, and who do not slander others. They do no wrong to their friends, nor spread rumors about their neighbors. They despise those whom God rejects, but honor those who obey the Lord. They always do what they promise, no matter how much it may cost. They make loans without changing interest and cannot, charging. Oh, char, thank you. They make loans without charging interest and cannot be bribed to testify against the innocent. Whoever does these things will always be secure from the Good News Bible. Okay. Does anybody qualify? Raise your hands if you qualify for that. <laughs> Notice in this psalm a repetition of many of the requirements originally stated in the writings of Moses. And we might add also very clearly spelled out. In fact, let's look at those. This is a familiar passage. Micah 6, 6 to 8. And give me a moment while I enlarge this. I don't know what happened. It was larger before. What shall I bring to the Lord, the God of heaven, when I come to worship him? Shall I bring the best calves to burn his offerings to him? Will the Lord be pleased if I bring him thousands of sheep or endless streams of olive oil? Shall I offer, shall I offer him my firstborn ch child to pay for my sins? And no, the Lord has told us what is good, what he requires of us is this, to do what is just or the righteous that would be, to show constant love and to live in humble fellowship with our God. Okay. What is implied by the idea of holiness? Let's think about that before you before you read it. What what is it when someone says holiness? What what does that bring up in your mind? Something of God. Set aside. Uh, okay, so the word actually came originally from a word which means to be set aside for a special purpose or to be set aside as, as closer to God. I mean, that was the idea, okay? This is dedicated to God. Distinct from other, yeah. from the mundane. Yeah, <clears throat> from, all, from all the enemies and so forth around you. Okay, Duane? Who has the right to go up to the Lord's hill? Who may enter his holy temple? Those who are pure in act and thought, who do not worship idols or make false promises. The Lord will bless them and save them. God will declare them innocent. Such are the people whom, who come to God, who come into the presence of the God of Jacob. Now, we don't have to worry about anything here because we don't worship idols anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Multitudes, this is from Ellen White. Multitudes have a wrong conception of God and his attributes and are as truly serving a false god as were the worshipers of Baal. Think about that one for a moment. Many, even of those who claim to be Christians, have allied themselves with influences that are unalterably opposed to God and His truth. Thus they are led to turn away from the divine and to exalt the human. Turn away from the divine, exalt the human. Prophets and Kings 177, paragraph one. Wow. 
God expects His faithful people not only to love and practice holiness and righteousness, but also to hate evil because of what it does to God's children. So what, what, what are we saying here? God is saying, okay, if you want to be my people, you need to recognize that you have to be separate from what's going on in our world. You, ha you need to be separate. You can't be just mingling with all these people and doing everything they do. That, that, that doesn't qualify. Just as the ancient children of Israel were expected to bring a perfect sacrifice without blemish, God expects us to come now as far as possible in completeness, even perfection. Remember, perfection means maturity into his presence. We are to come in blamelessness and righteousness. His final welcome will come only to those who have a close relationship with God. What would happen if God admitted the wrong people into heaven? Well, we said it before, it would be like hell for them. Yeah, it would be torture for them. Not only that, they would, one way or another, figure out how to start the whole great controversy all over again. Are we making conscious choices every day to avoid the evil and associate with and practice the right? What kind of things separate us from God? I guess that's mine. This is a, this is a challenge. I want you to let's think through this very carefully. From the Bible study guide, a perfect heart is the worshiper's greatest quality before God. The Hebrew tamim, perfect conveys the notion of completeness or maturity and wholeness. A perfect vine is whole, undamaged, and healthy. Animals offered as sacrifices had to be tamim, or without blemish. And there's references for all of that. Perfect speech is entirely truthful. A perfect heart, thus, is a pure heart, or heart of integrity. It seeks God and is restored by God's forgiveness. A blameless life springs from the acknowledgement of God's grace and His righteousness. Divine grace inspires and enables God's servants to live in the fear of the Lord, which means to live in unhindered fellowship with God and in submission to His Word. A testimony of a devoted and pious life brings praise to God and not to one's own self. You remember what it says in John 15, verses 34 and 35? It says, love your friends, love your neighbors, love your fellow Christians, just as I loved you. And if you do, everyone will recognize that you're my disciples. What does that say about all the other people? If the only ones who are truly loving are God's disciples, what does that say about everybody else? Clearly, it's, it implies that they are not. So, um, a testimony of a devout and pious life brings praise to God and not to one's own self. Notice that most requirements in Psalm 15 are given in negative terms. Negative terms. This is not about earning God's favor, but about avoiding the things that would separate us from God. So if we're going to be separate, we're going to be holy, we need to separate ourselves from what? all the corruption that's in our world, right? It's important to notice that doing God's will involves more than performing some righteous acts. It also involves avoiding evil actions. Psalm 96 talks about many different aspects of worship of which we should be aware, and I wish we had time to read it. We'll, we'll read a part of it here, but it's a long psalm. Um, for example, He has saved us, He created us, He will be our final judge in the end. So let's see, Jim, I guess that's yours, Psalm 96. Verses 1 to 17. Sing a new song to the Lord. Sing the, to the Lord all, all the world. Sing to the Lord and praise Him. Proclaim every day the good news that He has saved us. Proclaim His glory to the nations, His mighty deeds to all peoples. The Lord is great and is to be highly praised. He is to be honored more than any other gods, the gods of all nations, to me, all other nations are only idols, but God, the Lord created the heavens. Glory and majesty surround him, power and beauty, his, fill his, temple. Fill his temple. As the 
so you say to the nations, the Lord is king. The earth is set firmly in place and cannot be moved. He will judge the people with justice. Be glad, earth and sky, roar, roar sea, and every creature in you. Be glad, fields, everything in you. The trees in the woods will shout for joy when the Lord comes to rule the earth. He will rule the peoples of the world with justice and fairness. Good News Bible. And there's something important for us to recognize here. We in modern society tend to have a negative attitude about judges. You only have to go to court because you did something wrong or something like that. But God's judgment will, will take into account everything that you've ever done, number one. Number two, it will affect every person who has ever lived. They will go. And so it means that God not only condemns evil, but he rewards righteousness. So we just need to make sure that we're on the right side of that judgment, right? Ezekiel 18, if you just stop doing the bad things, you'll, you'll save yourself. Yeah. And so it, 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 digging up the, the past history is, isn't it. What you, most important thing is to listen. Mm -hmm. Listen to the words of well, the Creator. And a listen means the humble willingness to listen. Well, well, yeah, but I mean, it means that you're, you're really not. Yeah, well, that's what that really means. But because uh, we do, we have hear to be, noise and it's not. It. Yeah, we, we we need to be careful because uh, uh, the Bible also says there are people who, oh, I heard you, Lord, and then they go off and do their own thing. So we're not talking about that kind of listening. Right. So Jennifer, from the Bible study guide, worship includes singing to the Lord from Psalm 96, praising His name proclaiming his goodness and greatness, and bringing gifts to his temple. In addition to these familiar traits of worship, Psalm 96 highlights one not so obvious aspect of worship, the evangelical dimension in proclaiming the Lord's kingdom to other peoples. Oh boy, so we're supposed to do something, not just go and sit in the church pew, right? Yes. Yet, singing, praising, bringing gifts, and proclaiming the gospel are not separate actions, but are varied expressions of worship. The proclamation of God's salvation to all nation, nations gives substance to praise and content to worship. Notice how the reasons for worship coincide with the message proclaimed to other peoples. Quote, for the Lord is great. Quote, for all the gods of the peoples are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. The yeah. Lord reigns, and for he is coming to judge the earth. Let me interrupt for just a second. Suppose you were living in the ancient times of David, and you decided to travel over and visit one of these other nations. And someone comes out and says, let me take you to see something really special. Okay, let's go see. This is our God. Well, who made that God? Well, the guy that lives over there, he made it. Isn't that nice? And you would say, hold on. Our God made the entire universe. Huh? <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. It seems like they didn't seem to get that message, but it just hits me between the eyes. Okay, go ahead. Thus, the goal of evangelism is to unite other peoples with God's people and ultimately the whole creation and the worship of the Lord. From the Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide. Okay. Remember that as we have studied, God's judgment is not only in condemnation of the wicked, but also is in reward of the righteous. God's ultimate goal is the restoration of order, peace, and harmony throughout the universe. And you can only do that if you have people who love order and peace and harmony. What similarities do you see in the three angels' messages and the message of this psalm? That would probably take us a half an hour to really consider it, but it's something to think about. Unfortunately, there are people who have brought sacrifices to God which were not acceptable. When does that happen? Why would it happen? Duane? You do not want sacrifices and offerings. You do not ask for animals burnt whole on the altar or for sacrifices to take away sins. I thought that's... What Hold on, were. keep reading. <laughs> <laughs> Instead, you have given me ears to hear you. So I answered, here I am. Your instructions for me are in the book of the law. How I love to do your will, my God. I keep your teaching in my heart. 
So what he's, he's saying, the sacrifices are fine, that's good, and they're intended for a purpose, and we're going we're to get more into that in a moment. But he says, if it doesn't change your behavior, if it doesn't mean anything to you, God says, you might as well not have done it. Okay, you want to take the next one there too? I do not reprimand you because of your sacrifices and the burnt offerings you always bring me. And yet I do not need bulls from your farms or goats from your flocks. All the animals in the forest are mine and the cattle on thousands of hills. All the wild birds are mine and all living things in the fields. If I were hungry, I would not ask you for food for the world and everything in it is mine. Let the giving of thanks be your sacrifice to God and give the Almighty all that you promised. Call to me when trouble comes. I will save you and you will praise me. But God says to the wicked, why should you recite my commandments? Why should you talk about my covenant? You refuse to let me correct you. You reject my commands. You've done all this and I have said nothing. So you thought that I was like you. But now I reprimand you and make the matter plain to you. Listen to this, you that ignore me, or I will destroy you, and there will be no one to save you. Giving thanks is the sacrifice that honors me, and I will surely save all who obey me. Thank you. I'll go ahead and look at this next one. Psalm 51, remember this is the famous psalm that was part of David's repentance after the Bathsheba and Uriah experience. You do not want sacrifice, or I would offer them. You are not pleased with burnt offerings. My sacrifice is a humble spirit, O God. You will not reject a humble and repentant heart. O God, be good, be kind to Zion and help her. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will be pleased with proper sacrifices, and with our burnt offerings and bulls will be sacrificed on your altar. So what has to happen before these sacrifices have any meaning? What did it say there? Change of heart. Change your attitude. Change your heart, change your attitude, treat people the way they should be treated, etc. So God was not complaining about the sacrifices per se. Instead, he was complaining about the attitude of the people who bring the sacrifices. But does that mean we have to fix ourselves before we come? No, well, but it means we, we need to be ready and willing to change. If we're, no, no, God, don't ask me to change, but here's my sacrifice. Just take care of my problems and I'll go back and live the way I want. That doesn't work. You have to be adaptable. Ready to learn, ready to listen, as Jim would say. Like the prophets, the psalmist decry various misuses of worship. <clears throat> Their main point in these verses is not the Lord's aversion to Israel's sacrifices and festivals, but the reasons for such repugnance, the fatal distance between worshiper between worship and spirituality god is not rebuking his people for their sacrifices and burnt offerings but for their wickedness and acts of injustice that they have done in their personal lives and that's psalm 50 and several places the psalms are not preaching against sacrifice and worship but against vain sacrifice and empty worship demonstrated in the unrighteousness of these worshipers from our bible study guide as can be seen so often from the Old Testament, the ritual offering of sacrifice becomes nothing more than a useless waste of time. If praising God and offering the appropriate sacrifices does not bring us closer to, the, to His will, the whole exercise is worthless. Jim? When the, oh, excuse me, when the unity between the outward expression of worship and the correct inner motivation for worship falls apart, rituals usually become more important in and of themselves than does the actual experience of drawing close to God. That is, the form of worship becomes an end in themselves and opposed to God, to the God whom those rituals are supposed to point to and to reveal. Okay, so, um I don't know how we can say that in more in better ways. So just try to reemphasize that. Well, the greatest praise. Think about the Pharisees and what they were doing. 
Or you got these uh, prayers or praise services and the mm -hmm. singing and all that. And the, a lot of the singing is, is bad theology to boot. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just, uh, it, it, but people don't, they, they, they get emotional. And, and mm -hmm. there's no serious thinking going on when we just operate at the emotional level. Unfortunately, I remember one gentleman who's passed now, but he said often in many of these praise ceremonies, the songs are 7-Eleven songs. Seven words repeated 11 times. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> and that, that doesn't do the job. So what is, now here's the biggest question really of this whole lesson. What was the relationship between true repentance resulting in a right relationship with God and the offering of animal sacrifices? What would you do if all of a sudden we discovered some part of the Bible we hadn't understood properly and, and God says, okay, you need to start offering sheep? I think it's between like the mature understanding and the immature understanding. Okay. And so why would God ask him to do that? It's a tough question. It's not easy. Well, I don't know. I, 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 I think about, um, you know, animals that, that I've, we've had mm -hmm. as pets, you know, growing up out in the woods and in the country. And you get pretty close to some of those animals yes. sometimes. And to, to have to do something like that, that's, that's not an easy thing. No, it is not. Yeah. Even if you find out that your pet is dying of cancer or something, and so you think that the, you know, the, you know, the fairest or the, the, the kindest thing to do is to put them down, it's still not easy. Not easy at all. And if you think how, that maybe that's how sin affects God. So what, what's happening here, I think primarily, there's lots of extra stuff that we could add to it, but Basically, what God is trying to say to them is recognize that sin causes death. Sin causes death. When you sin, and unfortunately, it came to mean to many of the ancient Israelites, well, if you have a big enough flock, well, you can just offer a sacrifice every so often. That's an indulgence, basically. Mm-hmm. So what should we have learned from this lesson which applies to us as Adventists today? Repentance includes sorrow for sin and a turning away from it. We shall not, this is from Ellen White, we shall not renounce sin unless we see its sinfulness. Until we turn away from it in heart, there will be no real change in the life. There are many who fall, I'm sorry, fail to understand the true nature of repentance. Multitudes sorrow that they have sinned and even make an outward reformation because they fear that their wrongdoing will bring suffering upon themselves. But this is not repentance in the Bible sense. They lament their suffering rather than the sin. Such was the grief of Esau when he saw that the birthright was lost to him forever. Balaam, terrified uh, by the angel standing at his pathway with, with drawn sword, acknowledged his guilt lest he should lose his life. But there was no genuine repentance for sin, no conversion of purpose, no abhorrence of evil. Judas Iscariot, after betraying his Lord, exclaimed, you know, he throws down the money on the temple floor, I have sinned and I have betrayed the innocent blood. Steps to Christ 23 to 24. Wow. Although God dwells not, and this is again from Ellen White, although God dwells not in temples made with hands, yet he honors with his presence, the assemblies of his people. He has promised that when they come together to seek him, to acknowledge their sins and to pray for one another, he will meet with them by his spirit. But those who assemble to worship him should put away every evil thing, unless they worship him in spirit and in truth, and in the beauty of holiness, that means being separate from all these evil things, their coming together will be of no avail. Of such the Lord declares, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Matthew 15, 8 and 9. Those who worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such 
to worship him. John 4 from Prophets and Kings, page 50. And that story, that verse comes from where? Do you remember? John 4. That was his discussion with the Samaritan woman, remember? So, what is the worshiper's greatest offering to God? Jennifer, I think that's yours. Psalm 40, verses 9 through 10. In the assembly of all your people, Lord, I told the good news that you save us. You know that I will never stop telling it. I have not kept the news of salvation to myself. I have always spoken of your faithfulness and help. In the assembly of all your people, I have not been silent about your loyalty and constant love from the Good News Bible. Wow. Mm. You want to go ahead and do Romans 12 as well? Sure. Romans 12, verses 1 through 2. So then, my brothers and sisters, because of God's great mercy to us, I appeal to you. Offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to His service and pleasing to Him. This is the true worship that you should offer. Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind. Then you will be able to know the will of God, what is good and is pleasing to Him and is perfect from the Good News Bible. Okay, so now think of Paul in his day and what he was accustomed to in terms of worshiping in the temple. How does that fit with living sacrifices? He was used to what kind of sacrifices? Dead sacrifices. Mm -hmm. So now he's saying what? Offer yourselves as a living sacrifice. Offer yourselves as living sacrifices to God. In other words, be faithful, do what God asks, represent Him correctly to all that you associate with Him. Associate with, right? Different story completely. Mm. Well, uh, Dwayne? Um, let's see. His service? Maybe his service? Yes. His service should not be looked upon as a heart-saddening, distressing exercise. It should be a pleasure to worship the Lord and to take part in His work. From the okay. White Steps to Christ, page 103. The next point from the Bible Study Guide, how can worship of the Lord become a pleasure? Don't everybody talk at once. And the word... Worship, doesn't it mean the root of that is worth yeah, or right. to be a, a, what do you have, have value? A, a, what do you consider a value? Yeah, I think if, if we couch our discussion in, in that thing, it, it kind of kind of draws out what the meaning. Okay, be. so how do we, do we do we go and worship God in the church? Is that the way we worship what is most valuable to us? What happens if you take a walk out in nature and you're enjoying the wonderful mountains and the lakes and so forth? Is that a valuable, is that a valid worship? About following the golden rule. Yeah. Isn't, isn't that a, a speak louder? Well, that's certainly an option. Yeah, you know, things, things that are worthwhile for me, for example, would be the relationships that I have developed with people, mm -hmm. the people I enjoy spending time with. And Very good. Family and friends, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that, I think, is what he's looking for. Mm -hmm. Relationship. Okay. And children. We started out asking about the, how long children, about do children like long worships? Mm -hmm. They can be a very much of a drudgery. But if this is a time for you to do something with the family and activities together that you do and enjoy, the children are the first ones to say, yes, 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 mm -hmm. right? So that's the one way in which worship of the Lord can become a pleasure. Doing that in church is a bit more of a challenge. And we need to think about how that might be possible. Um, does it, does it, what, what did, well, of course, we, we talk, we use our children's Sabbath school classes. Jennifer, you have a seven-year-old that probably enjoys going to Sabbath school. And the, the teachers, if they're good, good 
children's Tavis school teachers, they make the they make even starting from the one two years old two year olds, they make this Sabbath school interesting. Pictures and all these kinds of things. These are ways in which you can make worship a pleasure. Okay, the key text for this lesson about worship is probably Psalms 104, 33. Uh, and so what does it say? Who is that? Jennifer, I think that might be yours. I will sing to the Lord all my life. As long as I live, I will sing praises to my God from the Good News Bible. Okay, I don't hear all of you singing. What's the problem? <laughs> <laughs> what is this implying here? We're supposed to pray always, right, as well. So you got to pray and sing at the same time, and you got to do it even when you're asleep. Now, what, what's, what are we saying here? I don't want to make this difficult. It just means that we should always have an attitude as if we are living our lives in the presence of God, because we are. And as we live in the, if we live our lives in the presence of God, we recognize, you know, His sovereignty, His power, His creative ability, the fact that we owe everything to Him. We wouldn't, we wouldn't turn around and, and maltreat another human being. At least we, I would, wouldn't think we would. We shouldn't. Jim suggested, practice the golden rule. And then if we have an opportunity to witness to someone and bring them to God, what, did, what does Luke 15 tell us? There's more rejoicing over what? Well, One but... sinner that repents and over 99 just people who need no repentance. So you want to make heaven rejoice? There's your task spelled out for you, right? Well, Worship may be summarized as follows. The response of the creature to the gifts of the Creator. Two Bible truths are, erect, are evident in this abstract. First, God has given many blessings to humanity. These gifts should awaken gratitude in the human heart for the greatness of God's love, so we may unite with the, pet, with the psalmist in proclaiming with the voice of thanksgiving all of his wondrous works. And... I mean, that's something that we ought to do on a regular basis. The psalmist's ardor to, for blazoning to others the greatness of God reminds us that worship has an evangelical dimension. What does evangelical mean? Spread the news. Say it a little bit louder. To spread the good news. Yeah. Good news. Evangelical in Greek means good news. Yeah. Or the news that can make you good. Well, that would be nice if it worked. <laughs> well, other, it, it should. A, a good news, if, if it doesn't sink in, yeah. it really hasn't done much. Yeah. So it has the potential there. Yeah. Thus, as a church, we should proclaim to the world the Lord's deeds for every individual and his divine mercy. Okay, where are we now? Psalm 26, verse 7. That's Duane. I sing a hymn of thanksgiving and tell of all your wonderful deeds. Okay, now, so the first thing that it should lead us to do is talk about what God has done for us, right? Second, human beings are, hard, are hardwired with an inborn predisposition to respond to God's wonders. What do we mean when we say hardwired? It's part of our makeup. It's the yeah. way it's, we think. Yeah, it's the, the way the brain works, right? In response to divine grace, we should bow with a grateful heart, submitting everything in our lives to the will of our Creator and Redeemer. What would happen if everybody did that? <laughs> that we'd have a state of atonement. Exactly. We would That's be. That's what the Creator is been attempting to do for the before the earth was created. Yeah, yeah. And we would be ready for heaven, right? It would be heaven. Or it there. would be, <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. Worship should come from the heart. At the same time, the book of Psalms instructs us that worship should not be conducted capriciously. 
What does capriciously mean? Well, uh, I want to be I want to be respectful here, but if we come together to worship God, and we, do, what do you think we, we? Do you have any idea? You have a few thoughts? It, it, it's, this should be a planned activity. Someone at least has put some thought into it. It's not just, no, I don't mean that, don't mean that if you say come together and says, well, let's sing a couple of songs. Do you have a favorite? Okay, that's, that's okay. But uh, there are appropriate ways to revere the Lord. Keeping a wise balance between gratitude and reverent submission will make our worship enjoyable and unifying. The Psalms are about how we worship God. They talk about our worship, how it should be conducted, and to whom it should be offered. There are times when psalms were written under very difficult situations. Can you think of a difficult situation in which a psalm might have been written? David was, and David was being chased by Saul. David was being chased by Saul, and he probably wrote a number of psalms under that, those circumstances. Okay, who's going to read that for us? Jim, I think I, that's yours. Psalms. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. I have so many enemies, Lord, so many who turn against me. They talk about me and say God will, keep, will not help him. But you, O oh Lord, are all... I'm sorry, my computer jumped all of a sudden there. Okay. Uh, but you, O oh Lord, are always my shield from danger and give me victory and restore my courage. I call to the Lord for help. And, for this, and from his sacred hill, he answers me. I lie down and sleep, and all night long the Lord protects me. Okay, I'm and I'm, I'm going to interrupt there for a second. Okay, you're David, and you've gone out with a big army to conquer uh, or to basically to attack an enemy army. What do you do at night? Your enemy's right, you're right over there. Yeah, you're, you're, I don't know that he's really doing it much sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the question. Do you, would you dare to lie down and say, okay, God, you can protect me. I trust you. Mm. I, I think he did. He sounds because like it. The value yeah. of the shadow of death or fear yeah. of evil. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, lie down to sleep, and all night long the Lord protects me. I am not afraid of the thousands of enemies who surround me on every side. Come, Lord, save me, my God. You punish all my enemies and leave them powerless to harm me. Victory comes from the Lord. May he bless his people. Good news, Bible. Okay. Many of the Psalms are obviously personal prayers or laments. These can be offered to God at any time and from any location. See, for example, and there's Psalm 9, 10, 30, 32, 34, 40, 41, 92, 107, 116, 138. So what is being suggested here? Pick out a psalm, one of these psalms, that you think represents a situation similar to what you're in right now, and kneel down if necessary, or even stand outside and look up to heaven and read that as a prayer. The paraphraser who wrote the Message Bible, he said that that's what he recommends to people. If they come to him and they say, well, I'm not sure how I should pray, he says, go and pick out a psalm that looks like it might be close to your experience and pray that psalm. I, I think that's a pretty, pretty good way to go. You might find more than one that would be appropriate. But for church worship to be ideal, every participant should be committed to serving God. Jennifer, I think that's yours. From Psalm 4, verses 3 through 4. Remember that the Lord has chosen the righteous for his own, and he hears me when I call to him. Tremble with fear and stop sinning. Think deeply about this when you lie in silence on your beds from the Good News okay. Bible. Lie on your bed and stop sinning. <laughs> Tremble with fear. And stop. Tremble with fear. 
Okay, we have studied Psalm 22 in the past from its prophetic details of the experiences of Jesus. I mean, that's the psalm that says, you know, Hello, 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 my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Etc. Other places about the dividing my clothes and all that kind of stuff. But this psalm also talks about praising God in the assembly. Duane? I will tell my people what you have done. I will praise you in their assembly. In the full assembly, I will praise you for what you have done. In the presence of those who worship you, I will offer sacrifices I promised. All nations will remember the Lord from every part of the world. They will turn to him. All races will worship him. The Lord is king and he rules the nations. All proud people will bow down to him. All mortals will bow down before him. Future generations will serve him. They will speak of the Lord to the coming generation. People not yet born will be told, the Lord saved his people. And in light of this, the proud people are gonna bow down. Not everybody's gonna bow down because they want to. Let me, let me read you a passage found in Philippians 2. And so in honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven, on earth, and in the world below, who, how many does that include? I think it's about everyone. It's not including very exclusive there, is it? <laughs> no, <but laughs> This includes the devil and all his associates will fall on their knees and all will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And that's all beings in heaven. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'll bet you that includes everyone in the universe. Yes, absolutely. I mean, this is a time, this is a time for absolute rejoicing. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how you could say it any better than that. I'm sorry. After carefully reading Psalm 22, it should be impossible for us to think that it is acceptable for us to worship only by ourselves at home. And there are some people who have that idea. Well, you know, I, I, worship is too big a deal. I can't, you know, those people at the church, they're, they're not good enough to worship the way I want to worship. Well, Psalm 146 to 150 focused particularly on praises to God. God delights in those who honor him and those who trust in his constant love. Psalm 147, 11. And if you remember how we started out a few weeks ago in the book of Psalms, we said that there are five books that are included in this, in, in, the, in the Psalms, and they start out with appeals and so forth, and they end with, praises. And here we have at the end of the psalm, we have five or six chapters, which are all about praising God. Okay, Jim, I think that's yours. The verbal halal, Hebrew, to praise, is used more than 30 times in Psalms 146 to 150. And each usage is related to God himself. Our reasons for praising the Lord, as given in these psalms, are manifold. The Lord is our God, our help and hope, Psalms 146.5. He is the creator and the sustainer. He defends and delivers the needy and the oppressed. He sustains the humble and punishes the wicked. He provides for the needs of his people and reigns forever. Summarize, uh, excuse me, Psalms 148.13 summarizes the preeminent reason for our worship and praise of God for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above the earth and heaven. New King James Version. The Lord is the only God there is, and his, he is worthy of praise because of his excellent greatness. Psalms 150. Wow. Two. Okay. A final topic for consideration in Psalms 146 to 50 is the use of live instruments in our devotion. Seven instruments are mentioned in these final psalms. Can you name them without looking? <laughs> Harp, timbrel, trumpet, lute, we're not sure what a lute is, stringed instruments and flutes, and loud clashing cymbals. 
Worship requires that we bring God our best gifts, and the area of the music is no exception. So what does that mean? We should have the very best. Well, I mean, if you look at the history of music down through the generations, hundreds of years, the very best music is religious music. Along these lines, parents would do well to encourage their children to learn to play a musical instrument and to sing. We should do all we can to facilitate the use of different kinds of instruments in our worship service. Ultimately, the focus of all the music in our worship service should be to, of course, to exalt our Savior. A very useful exercise for each one of us would be to practice praying the Psalms. We talked about a little bit about that earlier. It's something we should try. Open the Bible and kneel down before your bed or in an appropriate location and read or pray a psalm which seems appropriate for your current situation. Now you have 150 to choose from. Some of them are much longer than others, <laughs> but, but, but okay, choose one, pick a place. And, and so this should be done clearly with the idea of submission of God's will and praise of what he has done. So would, you, uh, would there ever be a time when it would be all right to uh, uh, pray on using David's uh, vengeance psalms? <laughs> would we be allowed to do that? Well, then don't everybody speak up at once. <laughs> I don't think so. You don't think so? No. It's all right for David to pray like that, but not all right for us? <laughs> Oh, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what, uh, clearly a lot of those were emotionally driven, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, if, you're, if someone's chasing you, trying to, to kill you, would that be appropriate? Maybe, maybe some of the more mild ones. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there's a huge variety, and you, this is your chance. Look through the Psalms, think of your situation, and see if you can pick out a Psalm that you think is appropriate for that situation. And it doesn't have to be, you know, once in your lifetime you do this, and, and that's everything you need to pray for the next 10 years. Think about a Psalm that's appropriate for your situation right now, and try praying that Psalm. And next week, the appropriate psalm may be a different one. But that's fine. God, we need to practice doing that kind of stuff. We need to make God real in our lives. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you so much for the blessings we receive from studying your word. We think of this huge variety that we have discovered in the book of Psalms. Violent psalms, some of them seem violent but blessed psalms. Think of Psalm 23 and Psalm 19 and other, other psalms like that. And psalms of forgiveness, of repentance, Psalms 51 and 20, 32, etc. Lord, help us to know how best to relate to you, to pray these psalms the way you would want us to pray them as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.